Bonjour. Hola. Jambo. Anle. Marhaba. Welcome to all of you, nearly 500 of you from all over the world joining us today. So our topic is Becoming Women in Tech. What does it take? Well, according to teen activist Vivian Hare, she said, tech connects us. It unites us and amplifies our power. And we have an esteemed group of colleagues who are joining us today. And I immediately want to welcome my co-hosts. First of all, we have our ASL interpreter, Mara Bassani Santa Maria. And we also have our co-host, uh, Isabella Correa, who is a senior at Presentation High School in San Jose. And she leads the student born board at the tech and she works with social change and climate justice organizations and aspires to be an environmental engineer. We are so thrilled to partner with the tech, a place that I've spent many, many years uh, visiting and also if then, which is a program of Lida Hill Philanthropies, who is another one of our partners. It is such an extreme honor uh, to have Craig Newmark and all of his support for this event and for our Advancing Women in Technology program. Now, all of you probably know, Craig is a web pioneer, a philanthropist who is leading advocacy and most commonly known for founding Craigslist. At its core, all of Newmark's philanthropic work helps to strengthen American democracy by supporting the values that our country aspires to be fairness, opportunity, and respect. Before I ask Craig to say a few words, I found um, a quote from him. So goes, I'd like to build a way for people doing good work to connect, to learn from each other, protect each other, and then I want to get out of their way. So without further ado, I welcome Craig Newmark. Adeline, uh, thanks. Seriously, in Sunday school, I was taught that we should treat people like we want to be treated. And I figure that applies to everything and everyone. That means fairness to everyone, where we aspire to a new normal, where this really does apply to everyone. That's an aspiration towards a new normal. Another way of saying this by someone uh, way smarter and braver than I've ever been is that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We're talking about creating a new normal of fairness. A new normal, I think, is created in part by the images presented in entertainment media. That's actually a really big deal. And the Gina Davis Institute is seriously a big part of making that happen. Beyond that, something that we as a country and a world need for our economic prosperity and for our national defense is we need the best people we can find in tech and particularly in uh, cybersecurity. That means we need help from places like the Gina Davis Institute. It's a big deal where I live for the most part in San Francisco and within Silicon Valley. And uh, speaking of Gina and San Francisco, uh, she doesn't know, but she helped me decide to make a move there. Uh, Jasmine, I think it's time to try to run that uh, video. Yeah. 
Yes, as someone remarked, that's uh, very 80s. And folks, it's my serious pleasure to introduce someone who's known as much for her tireless advocacy of gender equality in media, as much as for her accomplishments as an Academy Award winning actor. Please welcome Institute founder and chair, Gina Davis. Craig, thank you so much. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> That's so funny you found that old uh, video. Anyway, um, thank you so much. We are, uh, I just want to echo Madeline's um, words of gratitude for your support of this event and uh, our Advancing Women in Tech program and everything that you do for us. We appreciate it very much. Um, I am really excited. Uh, that we are hosting our first virtual event for girls. And uh, it means a great deal to us. We uh, care about you so much. Um, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about our origin story, how the Institute came about. It was actually because of my daughter, uh, who was two years old at the time, uh, when I started showing her um, little kids programs, you know, uh, preschool shows and G-rated videos and things like that. It was the first time that I noticed that there seemed to be far more female characters than male characters in what we are making and showing to kids from the very beginning, from the, from the youngest age. And I was absolutely stunned that in the 21st century, we would in effect be training kids to have unconscious gender bias by showing that girls are not as important as boys, they don't do as many important and interesting things, and they don't take up half of the population. It seemed uh, so obvious that we should be showing kids from the beginning that boys and girls share the sandbox equally. So um, that, uh, I won't go into the long description of how, uh, how it all launched, but my theory from the beginning was that if I could get the data on uh, the, the way that female characters were being presented in entertainment media for kids, uh, I could take it directly to the creators and show it to them and prove that we are showing a very imbalanced world to kids from the beginning because nobody seemed to really uh, be aware of this situation, which I thought was an enormous global problem. Uh, we all want to try to get rid of uh, bias against, against women. And yet here we were uh, training kids to have it without even realizing it, uh, that we were doing that. So um, our, our theory of change has actually proven to be uh, quite effective. We've been doing it about 15 years now, a little over 15 years. And, um, uh, and we do exactly what I had uh, wanted to do, which is uh, we do very extensive research on entertainment media. Uh, we get all the data and we share it directly, privately, in a very friendly and collegial way with uh, all our friends who have, uh, you know, run studios and production companies and guilds and anyone who's making content for kids. And um, the result has, has been that uh, people are very aware of this problem now. And we had some very excellent news um, in the last year. Uh, last fall, we updated our research for um, television programs made for kids. And in the spring, we updated our research on uh, family rated films, which is GPG and PG-13. And in both categories, we found that in lead characters, we have reached parity between male and female characters. And this is historic. This uh, is profoundly different 
from the way it was when we started. We still have a lot of way to go in um, the world of the story that's taking place, in, uh, you know, in the supporting and, and minor characters. Uh, we have a lot of more progress to make. Um, we have more pro progress to make uh, for people of color. We are at 30% now and uh, people of color are 38% of the population. So we have um, some more work we need to do there. And uh, we also work very heavily on uh, uh, people with uh, different abilities, uh, people with different body types, um, uh, ageism and uh, LGBTQ plus representation, uh, and also on STEM representation. Um, our theory is uh, if she can see it, she can be it. And to attract more girls to STEM uh, and to tech in particular, we need to change these stereotypes that are um, that children are exposed to very early on, and many of which are being perpetuated by the media. We don't have enough real life STEM role models to make a difference, so we need them in media. And uh, our we did a, a study with the Lida Hill Philanthropies called uh, Portray Her, and it showed that in TV shows and films, men are shown far more as scientists and technologists. And when female, uh, females are shown in those roles, they're often depicted as having to sacrifice their personal lives for their careers. Um, we also, uh, interestingly, we uh, partnered with Fox on a report called The Scully Effect, which looked at the character Dana Scully from the X-Files and her influence on STEM careers, on women going to STEM. And 63% of women surveyed who work in STEM said that Dana Scully was their role model for going into that field. That is astounding for one character to have that much impact. And it just goes to show you, uh, if she can see it, she can be it. And uh, that's what we want to do. We want to expose girls to STEM careers, to tech in particular, and uh, change these stereotypes that kids are exposed to very early on. Thank you very much. And please enjoy the program. We're so grateful for, to you for being here. Thank you so much for speaking on the incredible work that your institute is doing. I'd now like to pass it to Katrina Stevens, the Tech Interactive's first female president and CEO. Um, thanks, Isabella, and thank all of you for spending a bit of your Saturday with us today. Um, we're thrilled to be partnering with the Gina Davis Institute, If Then, and the Newmark Philanthropies to bring this program to you. Um, our mission at the Tech is to inspire the innovator in everyone, and we often say that everyone is the most important word in that sentence. Um, that's why events like today for young women are so important to us. We want to help you get excited about STEM and explore your interests. As a former teacher, I hope we can help you become inspired to be an innovator and prepared for a career in technology. Having more women in tech is so important. We know that diverse teams can identify, assess, and solve problems more effectively. We also know if we want to build solutions that work for everyone, you need a diverse team. Whether you're a Silicon Valley tech company or a social entrepreneur uh, or you know, solving a community problem. So we need people like you at the table. Uh, you're the generation that's going to solve some of our most challenging problems. I'm really excited to see what you're going to do. And so thank you for being here, and I look forward to the program. Thank you so much, Katrina. Like I said, we are thrilled to be um, partners uh, with you. So I wanted to give everybody a sense of what's going to happen. Um, in a moment, I am going to introduce all three of our key um, speakers. And then Isabella is also going to be asking uh, some questions um, to our speakers. We will hear from each of our speakers and then we will have a Q&A. So please do post any of your questions uh, you know, in the, in the chat. And once again, thank you to Craig Newmark. Thank you to Lida Hill and Lida Hill Philanthropies and their If Then ambassadors who are featured uh, scientists today. Um, also, some of you know um, the Institute um, we are executive producers and supporters of Mission Unstoppable, which is on CBS this morning. And we're really excited that season two will be happening uh, momentarily. 
And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce quickly um, each of our three speakers. So I'm going to ask you all to bring on your cameras. Uh, so in no particular order, I'd love to bring on uh, Siobhan Day, who is the Assistant Professor Information Scientist Systems um, for North Carolina State University. Um, one thing that I pulled from her bio that I thought was very ins inspirational is that she said she would watch her father while he plucked away at the keyboard writing scripts, and she aspired to be just like him one day, and computing became her passion. So welcome, uh, Siobhan. Um, Ashley Podoraski is the Associate Dean of the Beacon College of Computer and Cyber Sciences and Associate Professor of Digital Forensics at Dakota State University. And uh, one of her comments that I thought was incredibly inspiring is that she is an investigator of the internet and she loves the field of cybersecurity and she hopes and she loves the fact that she can help solve real cybercrime investigations. So um, welcome, Ashley. And last but not least is uh, Crystal Dilworth. Um, who is a science communicator. You may also know her as Dr. Brain, as she is a regular on our Mission Unstoppable show. And she chose to study the brain because she hated being told what to do and what to think. And that's what the brain does. And she thought by, well, if she figured that out, she would figure it out how we become who we are. So welcome, um, Crystal Dilworth. Thrilling to have you. So over to you, Isabella. It's so great to meet all our speakers. Our first question for you is, who is your favorite STEM character, real or not? And we'll start with Dr. Dilworth. So my favorite woman in STEM is Princess Leia from Star Wars, because if she didn't have those CS skills, then the Death Star plans would not have gotten hidden in R2-D2 and the whole movie wouldn't have happened. So even though she's fictional, I still appreciate a CS woman that can save the world. Definitely. Dr. Grady, would you like to go next? Yes, my favorite is Katherine uh, Johnson. She was the mathematician and hidden figures that helped get uh, one of the astronauts into orbit, into outer space. And so she she's wonderful. She's also one of my sorority sisters and you can see the pink and green in the background. So she's my favorite. That's so cool. Dr. Podraski. Part of what I liked about the, the study that was conducted by the Gina Davis Institute was Scully and her work in science and advancing in that space to me was very inspirational. Thanks for sharing your responses, everyone. And it's great to see everyone in the chat sharing theirs as well. So we're going to move on to our first audience poll question. And the question is going to be, how are you feeling about the impact of AI? Well, I'll just jump in um, and I don't have my own words, but Matt uh, Mullenweg said, technology is best when it brings people you know, together. And I'm really excited to hear from each of our speakers. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, Siobhan Day Grady um, to uh, take it away. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. I believe you all can see my screen and I'm happy to get started. I first wanna say thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you all and I hope that something I share today will be inspiring for you on your tech journey. As was mentioned earlier, I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina Central University um, in information science and systems. So let's talk a little bit about who am I? 
for my educational background, I'm very proud to say that I'm a three-time graduate of HBCUs. And what that stands for, if you've never heard of an HBCU, is that stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And so I'm a three-time graduate. I went to Winston-Salem State, North Carolina Central, where I work now, and also North Carolina a and State University. I am a artificial intelligence researcher. And so if you're not sure what artificial intelligence is, and I think that you are because we just took that poll, so I saw a lot of people were hopeful, I am too. It's in everything that we do. So for instance, if you have an Alexa device or a Google Home, if you're talking to it, it's recognizing your voice. That has some type of AI technology behind the scenes. It's recognizing your accent, your dialect, all the things about you. Also with our devices that we use constantly, they, they track our patterns. So if you have a smart watch, sometimes it'll tell you to stand up. Hopefully you've been standing up during this pandemic and getting some exercise in, I definitely have. But that's a little bit about AI. And what I do specifically is I'm a machine learning expert. And so machine learning, what that means is that we take data and we analyze it and we do some type of predictive analysis. And that's sort of what I was mentioning about the smart watch, about telling you to stand up or recognizing your daily patterns. And that's in almost everything that we use today. Professionally, I have worked in higher ed on the IT side. So I've been an IT staff person and now I'm a faculty member. So I love teaching and educating people. And so I, I love being a professor at North Carolina Central. And then on a personal, excuse me, personal note, I used to like traveling. Um, that's not so much happening now, but I love cooking and I really enjoy reading. So here are some points of pride that I want to share with you. Let's talk about some grants that I currently have that are active that I'm working on. So there's an organization, a funding agency called the National Science Foundation. And currently, if you've heard of self-driving cars, they're also known as autonomous vehicles. And I'm using machine learning on that project. So I'm very excited about that because whether we know it or not, self-driving cars, they're here and they'll become more available to cons consumers in the future, very soon future. And what I do with that is I determine faults. And that is a real concern because we want these self-driving cars to be safe. We want, when we're on the road, if a fault is actually happening, we wanna make sure that it's not a malfunction with the system, that it's actually real fault happening and we wanna be able to detect it so that we can save a life or help that driver or lack of a driver, the passenger in the car. So I'm excited about that research. I also do research with uh, the If Then Initiative. So I saw one of the questions uh, in the chat was, um, how do you get a community-based startup going? So what I decided to do is I was awarded a grant with the If Then Initiative. So you've heard of do it yourself. Well, I coined STEM it yourself. I'm actually working with middle school girls to cultivate that STEM identity because I want to change the future of what STEM looks like. It can look like anything that we want it to be. And so I'm actively working on that now with STEM it yourself. I also do work in a field called uh, human computer interaction. And so with that, I'm actually seeing how I can develop a website that will actually be working with ladies who have HIV so that they can stay um, not isolated during times like COVID-19. They need to be with people that they can build community and feel safe where they can follow their adherence. And I also do research in one other field um, with authorship. So I love social media. I hope you all do too. And I determine authorship of tweets and that I use machine learning to do. So that's a little bit about the research that I do. In addition to that, I'm an uh, If Then ambassador. I also have been a Black Compute Her fellow and awardee, and I'm actually a Black Girls Code core member. Outside of all that, I just wanna let you know that I'm a real person, right? So I'm a daughter, a friend, I'm a wife, sorority sister that I mentioned earlier, and also our new vice president elect, Kamala Harris, she's also my sorority sister. So I'm very proud to be a part of uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Teacher, researcher, all the things. And if you're wondering how I'm able to do all of that, I am too. But 
I actually come up with something every year. I come up with a hashtag for the year that kind of keeps me going. And that's in the lower left-hand uh, screen. It says 2020 is epic. Every year I come up with a hashtag and I use that as my mantra to keep me going throughout the year. And so maybe that's something that can help you all too. So as a computer scientist, you've probably have heard of, even if you're not computer science, something called an algorithm. And all that is, is just a set of steps that we use to solve a problem. And so today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about my algorithm or my set of steps that you can do to implement yourself into becoming a part of tech yourself. And so as was mentioned, my father was in tech. So all of what you're hearing about, there's not enough women in STEM. I didn't even know that was a thing because it was in my household. So I never knew that I was overcoming barriers because I grew up believing that I could do this. But just in case you are not in that same type of environment, I wanna say, here's some things you can do. Let's try to realize your passions early. So I learned early that I love the arts. I love music. I love dancing. I love beautiful artwork, all of those things. I also really love computers. I did at an early age. And part of that's because I'm an only child. So I would stay on the computer all day, all night. And video games, it was the same thing. <laughs> I couldn't put down the controller. And also I love sports. So if you can identify what it is that you love to do now, kind of hone into that because that may be your passion and sometimes it can lead into your purpose. Then also, if you're able to volunteer or sign up to gain exposure, you are already doing that because you're here now. So that's a plus. Some of the programs that I did, there were summer programs that I was in as a child. Also, there was something called MSEN that was a math science and engineering network. And then when I started college, I got a chance to be a part of a program called MSOP, which stands for the Minority Science Outreach Program. And by being in those programs, I got to be around other like-minded individuals that allowed me to continue to gain that confidence and also work and meet people who love the same things that I did too. Also, identify role models. So, for me, it was my parents, not only my dad, but my mother worked at IBM for until she retired from IBM. And so I always had technology in the home. And so I was very fortunate to do that. But even outside of technology and having it in my home, I just am inspired by my parents. They worked really hard to provide for me. And so that work ethic that they had, it was just instilled in me. And so because of that, I do still look up to my parents. You can also have teachers that you look up to and sometimes even celebrities. One of my favorite celebrities right now is Michelle Obama. I just adore her. She is a hardworking person, although she's in the law field and she's been with politics and helping uh, the former president of the United States. I just love her. She's amazing to me. And there's many other people that I look up to as well. And that's what keeps me going. So identify a role model because that might help give you a roadmap to where you want to go. Also have a support system. So if you don't have a mentor, that's the first thing on your list when you finish today. Get a mentor. This is someone who can help guide you to where you need to be. And I just want to share this. It's okay if you don't know where you want to go or what you want to be just yet. That's the beauty of life, especially at your age. You can try and do many different things to figure that out. And that's why I was saying, you know, identify what some of your passions are so that you can know or get a feel of what you might want to do. So find a mentor. And I wanna say mentorship does not stop at any specific age. I still have many mentors and people that pour into me. Also family because the road gets tough sometimes. You want to have family, friends, other professionals that can help be there for you on your journey to tech or becoming that woman in tech. And I, if you don't remember anything else that I said today, I want you to remember this last thing that's a part of the algorithm and that's be resilient. That is the ability to bounce back when something happens. If you can do that, you'll be successful not only in tech, but in life, because the road can get challenging. Which leads me to this, challenges. So with me 
being the only. Sometimes I was the only girl in the class or woman, or I might be the only black woman. So those might be things that you face too. We are not one dimensional. And there's something called intersectionality that can be gender, race, class, et cetera. So many different things. And that's why we all have very different experiences and we have to be respectful of other people's experiences because there's not a one size fits all. So being the only has been challenging, but I want you to know you can persevere. I have, but it was challenging at the time and it still is challenging. Being judged, oftentimes when I walk into a room, I, I feel and I know that sometimes the first thing that comes to people's mind is not that I'm a scientist, but that's okay. When I start to open my mouth and speak, they quickly understand that I am. And so that's okay, but it does cause me to constantly prove myself, so to speak. That is a current challenge. And hopefully that will change over time, but it's gonna ch not change necessarily with me, but it will change with all of you joining this workforce with me. And then last thing is imposter syndrome. So that's sometimes when we feel like maybe we don't belong, even though we've done all the things that indicate that we do. That is a normal feeling, but as I mentioned before, with the support system, having other people present to tell you, no, you do belong to be here, that is so critical. So make sure that even though you might experience some of these same challenges that I have, that you don't get stuck on them. And that is all that I have. This is my contact information. And one fun fact is myself, along with uh, Ashley, uh, Dr. Ashley coming up is we all have some statues that were created in our likeness. And so if you get a chance, please visit one of the exhibits and check us out. And I thank you all so much for listening to my algorithm uh, for success. And I do have one fun thing for you. Uh, there's not enough time for me, but I do have a Kahoot game if you like Kahoot and I'll drop it in the chat where you can take a quiz just to make sure you were paying attention uh, to my talk today. And that's the educator in me. Thank you all so much. Thank you for such an empowering presentation, Dr. Grady. You are involved with a variety of organizations, hobbies, and projects. With your career being a culmination of so many different experiences, my question for you is, why do you think your involvement in all these different things has been important for where you are now? Oh, it's been important because each one brought something different. So one thing that I love about computer science is I told myself I'm, one day I'm going to be that cool grandma because <laughs> technology is ever changing. And what I want to say is that I'm also ever changing. I'm constantly evolving. Who I was at 13, I'm not that person now. And I may not even still be the same person next year. So I want to say that every organization that I've been a part of has given me something new, a new tool to put in my tool belt. And so by you all choosing to be a part of many different organizations, it will allow you those same opportunities to get new tools to put in your tool belt. And remember, it's okay to change because that is one constant thing in this life. Thank you for the great advice. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Madeline to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much. Um, and before we bring on um, Dr. Ashley Podrosky, uh, Martina Navarrova said, security used to be an inconvenience, but now it's a necessity all of the time. So uh, take it away, Dr. Ashley. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation and for hosting this wonderful event. We have all felt the panic of losing our phones. After all, your phone is how you connect with the world. It's how we check social media, send texts, take pictures, see where your friends are, send an email, get directions, and most importantly, it's how you call your mother, Chloe and Hudson. Simply put, our phones tell our life story. If all 500 of you on this event today put your phones in front of me, with my mobile forensic investigative tools, I would be able to match each and every single one of you up with your phone without fail. With everything you do on your phone, they are a natural target for criminals. If they can get access to them, they know who you are where you live, 
who your friends are, how much money you have, things you only tell your best friends, and what you're thinking. You know, Dr. Google, what's that rash? Hackers do not have to physically have access to your phone. They can gain access through a remote compromise, which is why, just like you don't get in the van with a stranger who has candy, you don't click on the link in the text message from someone you don't know. I'm an investigator of the internet. Crime doesn't just happen on the streets. It's happening on your phone, your computer, your gaming console, and your smart home devices. Every single crime has a digital component. People are not just using these devices to commit crimes. They're often the target of crimes as well. I have a strong passion for the field of cybersecurity in digital forensics because I get to help solve real cybercrime and help organizations and law enforcement in keeping our cities, states, and country safe. You could say that at Dakota State University, we're teaching future cyber investigators how to conduct a digital forensic investigation while helping individuals, businesses, and organizations protect their data, money, and online identity. One particular area of expertise to my team and I is the dark web. You are all undoubtedly well-versed with the regular internet, but probably have not heard or used a Tor to access the dark web. While the dark web was created for government data privacy, it is now a favorite platform of hackers and cyber criminals. In the DigForce lab, Digital Forensics for Cyber Enforcement, at DSU, we are identifying, acquiring, and analyzing dark web content to keep all of us safe. We are working to find stolen credentials to alert users to change their passwords, to find vulnerabilities for sale that could compromise a company. Essentially, we're working to protect you and your community. One case I can talk about because it's been adjudicated is a drug dealer selling drugs on the streets in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The known drug dealer was stopped and on his person, he had a computer, a cell phone and a memory card. After going through all of the, the required investigative processes, the drug dealer's computer phone and memory card were brought to the DSU Dig Force lab. At the lab, our rock star investigator, Erica, analyzed the devices and found that he was using the dark web to buy his drugs. Further, we found an unknown file on the system in, that we couldn't attribute to anything. So what we did is we decided to reverse engineer the file. And that's just a fancy way of saying we're breaking it down to the code level. And we wanted to understand what it was designed to do. It was determined through that investigation that the code was ransomware that was designed to infect machines and send cryptocurrency back to the drug dealer. That's how he was funding his operation. So the bad guy was buying his drugs through the ransomware profits. After the investigation, the drug dealer went from a simple offense to possession, um, to pleading guilty to distribution. Now this helps keep our streets safer. This is an issue we see all across our country. I haven't always worked directly with law enforcement. I used to consult with organizations and businesses on hacking and misuse situations. In one case, I got to help respond to an industrial espionage case where an employee was selling trade secrets to competing international entity. In that situation, I had three different devices to analyze that had more than 10 years of data. So to simplify my role, think of a funnel, okay? So at the top of the funnel is all of the data. And at the bottom of the funnel is only the relevant data. And that's my job is to get the relevant data from all of that other data. There's a tremendous amount of noise in our cases but it's our job to find the little digital breadcrumbs to help solve the case. 
Now, as a kid, I always thought I'd be a lawyer because I loved a good debate, but I also love computers and technology. And now I get to work with law enforcement and the legal community on fighting cybercrime. It's the perfect combination of my interests and background. Digital forensics to the criminal investigations is having the same impact that DNA did in the 90s because every single case has a digital component. Check out dsucyber.com and see what we're doing and how we can help you advance your career. Cybersecurity is one of those industries that is recession-proof and pandemic-proof. The gap of skilled workers and available positions continues to widen every single day. Now, an even bigger gap exists between women in cybersecurity. We are only 24% of the industry, and I wanted more women around the table, so I founded CybHer at DSU with my colleague, Dr. Pam Rowland in 2013. Since then, we have impacted over 23,000 girls all across the country and in several countries. In that time as well, we have had a 595% increase in women studying undergraduate programs of computer science, cyber operations, and network security in the Beacom College of Computer and Cyber Sciences at Dakota State University. To this end, we know if we want more women in cybersecurity, we have to start with girls. While CyberHer traditionally focuses on middle school girls, we have cr created more content for high school girls. And I have something very exciting to offer the audience today. CyberHer at DSU received a grant from the National Security Agency to offer camps for kids to learn about cybersecurity. Traditionally, we have camps during the summer and we have 125 girls that come to campus for completely, it's completely free and they get to spend an entire week with us doing all sorts of hands-on activities. Now, with our current situation, we had to move our camp virtual. So right now, we have 90 girls across the country starting a virtual middle school girls camp. But when I was asked to do this event, I decided to reserve 30 seats for all of you high school girls across the country. You'll get hands-on training in data privacy, learn about mobile forensics, learn how to code Python, how to conduct cryptography, and more in the six module program. The best part is, is that you will have mentors who are college women, and you'll get to meet other girls like yourselves around the country who are interested in this space. Because if like myself, I'm assuming there's not a lot of people at your school that have your interests. So this brings you together and lets you meet others with your interests all across the country. Now, if that wasn't enough, every camper will get a free Sphero robot as part of their kit. So we will send you a, a full kit that has everything you need to do to learn uh, cybersecurity and a Sphero that you get to keep and learn how to code it. Uh, my kids love this and if you, or a beginner coder or you're an expert, or expert, you can do so many things with this. Now, while I have funding for 30 of you, if we have a lot of demand, I'll do some fundraising. So challenge me, make me work to get more seats and more packages for all of you to join. To conclude, everything we do is digital. You can go to school online, shop online, see your doctor, and conduct nearly every aspect of your lives digitally, although I wouldn't recommend it. With that said, more and more cyber crime is being conducted. We need women like all of you who are curious, who want to understand how things work, and who wanna make a difference in their communities, in our country, to join cyber warriors across the country fighting cyber crime. Thank you.
Wow, what an amazing presentation. And it's so great to hear about this opportunity that you're offering to so many girls. My question for you is, what is the best advice someone has ever given you? Or do you have any role models or mentors that have helped you get to the point you are now? So when you asked me that, I wanted to pull up a quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg because I love her. Um, anger, in, it was a quote that I saw on her documentary that her mother said to her, uh, anger, resentment, envy, and self-pity are wasteful reactions. They greatly drain one's time. They sap energy, better devoted to productive ende endeavors. What a great quote and very relevant to today. So thank you. I'll be passing it to Madeline to present our last speaker. Yes, and before we bring up Dr. Brain, as we all know her, uh, Dr. Crystal Dilworth, uh, Joyce Carol Oates said, the brain is a muscle of busy hills, the struggle of unthought things with things eternally thought. So without further ado, take it away. Dr. Crystal. Oh, thank you guys so much. I'm really excited to be here and talk a little bit about why I do what I do and why I am Dr. Brain. So this is the computational system that I work in. It's incredibly complex. And if you think about the cells that are talking to each other and sending single signals to each other, kind of like a system of firing, not firing, you can kind of get the idea that the neurons in our brain are talking to each other in zeros and ones, similar to the way the computers talk to each other. But it wasn't that interaction that really got me excited about the brain. I just think people are weird and I wanted to know why do we do what we do? How come we behave in such illogical ways sometimes? Why do groups of people do what they do and how do we become who we are? I think maybe it was this idea of identity that first got me started. My mom immigrated to the United States from Indonesia and she had to learn how to be an American and learn to develop a new identity in this new land while also trying not to lose the old identity and connection with the place that she was born. And so I think maybe in seeing her adapt um, and create an identity for herself, I started to wonder, how do we do that? And what's responsible for that? And what that is, is the brain. And the brain is really important in two ways. One, it, um, allows us to analyze data and to um, make predictions about the future, but it also is responsible for emotions and expression. And that was really what excited me when I was very, very young. I was a dancer. The connection of physicality to emotion and storytelling and music was what I thought I was going to dedicate my life to. I really thought I was going to be a ballet dancer. As you can see here on the upper right hand side, I was a ballet dancer for Halloween seven years in a row. Like I really thought that this was going to be my life. But um, my mom ended up as a microbiologist. My dad was a physicist and they were pretty, pretty, pretty convinced that uh, I needed to be a scientist when I grew up. So one of the challenges I faced was feeling like I had to choose. I had to choose art or I had to choose science. Um, and most of my early life, I was feeling pulled in these opposite directions. But I was taking psychology because I wanted to understand people um, and I was interested in human expression. And I was taking organic chemistry because my parents told me I had to. But it was a good thing that I was taking both of those classes at the same time because I started to see that chemicals and molecular functionality, the shape of those chemicals actually influenced our biology. And they were actually the language that the brain used to communicate about mood and emotion. And that's really what made up behavior. And that was my aha moment. That's, I think, when I really became a scientist, although I didn't know it at the time. And brains communicate in two ways. They use these chemicals, these different chemical languages to to communicate to each other, the neurons communicate to each other to um, tell them different messages, but they also propagate messages through electronics. And that's sort of where the tech comes in. 
So signals are sent throughout a cell using electronics, electric signals. And at the, at the terminals, at the ends, when the two cells need to talk to each other, they release chemicals. And how much and which chemical they release is part of how the data in the brain is encoded. And we can study different circuits and systems the same way you have electronic circuit or a, a circuit or a network um, in computer science the brain has these as well. So different parts of the brain are responsible for different tasks and they talk to each other using different percussive patterns and different chemicals. And I think this is amazing because how circuits like the one that I'm showing here, which is a system of dopamine signaling. So dopamine is the molecule that is the language that this circuit is using. How activation of this circuit can lead to dependence on drugs is what I studied during my PhD. So my PhD was in the molecular basis of nicotine dependence. So I looked how exposure to nicotine changed the function of this circuit and then led to downstream human behavioral outcomes. But we can also measure the electronics in the brain. And if we wanna study what's going on deep in the middle of the brain, we actually have to get a probe in there in order to measure and analyze the electrical patterns that the neurons are using to signal each other. And so what you can see here, and this isn't done very often, is a human patient with electrodes surgically implanted in their brain that allows a technician to connect them to a computer that can read the activity of the individual neurons in their brain, and we can better understand what the brain wants and how it signals the body to do that. Now that's really important because the patients in these studies are paraplegics and the regions that the um, electrodes are touching deep inside the brain are actually the regions that control movement. So when we're looking at the neuron activity in these parts of the brain, these parts of the brain aren't damaged actually. The spinal cord is severed. So the brain is still sending signals to move the legs or move the arms. And we wanna understand the pattern of those signals. And we use computers and actually machine learning to better tune our understanding of the different activities of individual neurons. So in this slide, each little square with a little waveform in it is recordings from an individual neuron in that patient's brain. And we use computers and machine learning to better understand the shape and the patterning of each one of these, these signals so that we can understand how that relates to human behavior. And we can do that for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different ways. Um, I'm going to skip over <laughs> this slide because I know we don't have a lot of time, but what I really wanted to show is that we can use our knowledge of the circuits in the brain and the electronic percussion firing of neurons to help, help people communicate that have lost the ability to do so. We can use our knowledge of those patterns to help move, for instance, prosthetic limbs with only a thought. And we can go the other way around, like the case in Parkinson's disease, and we can inject the proper pattern of activity into the brain to help things like the central tremor behavior of Parkinson's disease by correcting for what's abnormal in those brains. So it's all about communication inside the brain and out. And that's why I ended up switching careers from research scientist to science communicator. So now, I help communicate about science. So you can see me here, you can see my camera crew um, also um, in this shot. And we are, we're helping to communicate why the study is important, who is involved in the study, and to help other people, let you guys understand that there is ongoing research where we're looking at brain machine interfaces that can help inform and hopefully develop technologies that will allow brainwave reading to become a physical output so that these quadriplegic patients or others like them may be able to interact with their world um, in a way that exceeds what they're capable of doing now. And I think we're gonna put the link in the chat, but if you wanna see the whole episode on brain machine interfaces, um, the link um, is 
down here at the bottom of the slide, but hopefully it'll be in the chat as well. And so I get to talk to scientists and technologists now and I use my science background to interpret what they're telling me. Um, other people that are working on brain machine interfaces right now, like Elon Musk or the neuroscientist Philip Lowe, who I'm talking to now, we're talking about um, how we can use computers to better understand what the brain is doing and also how we can use how the brain works to better inform design of new types of computers. And so that's why I am Dr. Brain. Um, I love talking to people about the potential for science, the scientists that actually do the work, um, and how we can use science to better understand our world. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, but I'm really happy to be here kind of explaining how I was able to align what I thought were two completely different, di disparate aspects of my personality, performing arts and dance and expression and scientific um, understanding into a career that I didn't even know existed when I went to college, um, allowing me to be on TV now sharing science with the world. Wow. It's been incredible to see how you've intersected so many different interests to pursue your goals. My question for you is, where do you see yourself in five and 10 years? Oh, goodness. I try not to. I try not to get too emotionally uh, married to a particular outcome. But I know that the work that I want to do um, in, the, in the next five or 10 years is helping other people understand themselves and their world so that they can become sort of masters of their own destiny and they can maybe create a career for themselves that they didn't think was possible. So I sort of take like a iterations on the model approach. I look at what I want out of my life and I make small changes to hopefully get myself there and I run the experiment and then I go back and I I realign if, if things didn't work out or if things went really well, then I I shift the model in that direction. That's great. Thank you. So now we're going to transition into our general Q&A, but I'll pass it to Madeline first. Yeah. So one thing, just for those of you who may not be in the chat and who want to apply for the camp that you heard um, Dr. Ashley talk about, if you go to cyber.org, C-Y-B-H-E-R.org and hit camps, you'll be able to navigate uh, for the application. Um, so without further ado, unless Ashley, you wanted to say something more about that, Isabella, I'll turn it over to you to pull one of our questions. Great, thank you. And for those of you who have any questions as our speakers are answering, feel free to continue to add anything into the Q&A function so we can find them easily. So my first question for all of you is, what advice do you have for those in the audience who are interested in STEM, but they've had little exposure to it or don't know how to get involved? And we'll start with Dr. Grady first. Yeah, it's, it's more of what I mentioned in, in my presentation, you know, apply for those opportunities. If you're here today, that means you're already looking for them. Uh, make sure that you're speaking with your guidance counselors as well, um, teachers. Make sure you're asking all people who may be in the know if you don't know where to find them. And also the internet. You can also look to see there's a lot more things that are offered now than used to be. Um, so word of mouth is also just like today, Dr. Ashley is sharing this opportunity with you all. I mean, it's word of mouth. You're in the right place at the right time. So this is just in conjunction with what I mentioned in my presentation. So the same, same things. Just look for those opportunities, apply for them and be present so that you can find out sooner what it is you love to do. Dr. Dilworth, would you like to add? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. If you have teachers that are working, you know, in your science teachers, I would say that's easy place to start. Um, for me, as a science communicator, I know that I have so many amazing colleagues that put out a lot of videos and information about science, 
scientists. So I would say use what's available to you online to figure out exactly what area of research really gets you excited um, and then focus in and don't be afraid to do a cold reach out. Sometimes you just got to send an email and say who you are and why you're excited about what that person does and ask them for their advice. I would say don't get intimidated. Um, imposter syndrome, as Dr. Day brought up, is, is, is real. You think that you don't belong. You think that they know more. But just know that you have value and you bring a perspective that's needed because we need different perspectives to solve the challenging problems that we have in cybersecurity and in science. And so don't get intimidated. Thanks for all the great advice. I'm sure the audience loved that. So our next question is from Catherine Westfall in the Q&A feature. And she asks, who are your mentors in the media right now? And we can start with Dr. Podraski for this one. You know, there's not a lot of women in, in the media that are doing uh, areas in my uh, field of digital forensics and cybersecurity. Um, but I have a lot of very powerful members, uh, mentors across the country that are just phenomenal. Um, Dr. Amberine Siraj, she's at Tennessee Tech. She started Women in Cybersecurity, wesis.org. Um, just, just incredible women who are doing great things. And as mentioned, if you want to learn more about someone, knowing someone who's doing something great, something great, just reach out to them. Um, Diane Genesek, she's a commandant of the National Cryptologic School at the National Security Agency, is a fantastic mentor for me and is always available for me to ask questions or have ideas and, and just get some, you know, figure out how we can do cool things like this for kids around the country. Yeah, I can go next. Um, there's many, uh, I feel like I have a long laundry list of uh, people that uh, that I look up to in my field of, as far as the media is concerned. Um, but Dr. Ayanna Howard, she's a roboticist at Georgia Tech University. Um, that's somebody I look up to. She's doing great things. Um, as far as uh, media, there's people I follow on Twitter that I do know that are in computer science, Dr. Faye Cobb Payton, uh, Dr. Tanya Smith-Jackson, Dr. Nikki Washington, those are all women that I, I look up to that I'm following kind of how they navigate uh, media. And I just try to practice and make sure that I say and, and hopefully do the right things too. Well, I'm really lucky to be working on Mission Unstoppable, the television show. So the people that I get a chance, that I look up to, I get a chance to, to work with. So. Gina Davis for all of the amazing work that she's done on um, diversifying the face of science and also um, bringing more spotlights on the work that women are con contributing to science through uh, the Mission Unstoppable show. She's one of my, uh, my role models and also Anna Wenger who is the showrunner for Mission Unstoppable. And just speaking with her and her commitment to showing exactly all of the different dimensions that women scientists bring to the table and all of the strengths that we bring to our job, not just the, not just the smarts, the book smarts, um, but all of the other aspects of our personality and being willing to put that on screen, I think for me is the work that needs to be done right now. And I am thrilled to be a part of that effort. Definitely, thanks for the great responses. So this question is coming in from Eleanor. And this is uh, directly for Dr. Podraski, and it's what is the biggest challenge scientists face in digital forensics today? And she says, thank you. She's a current college forensics major. Oh, awesome. I love to hear that. Well, the biggest problem that we have is that the, the rapid change of technology, how it evolves. You know, an iPhone is not an iPhone is not an iPhone. Um, when we want to investigate a Windows PC, it could be on a multitude of different hardware platforms, but the core NTFS file structure, um, what makes an operating system is the same. However, with mobile, with people doing almost all their stuff on mobile, um, firmware, patches, uh, versions, everything impacts it. So 
uh, without a doubt, uh, mobile forensics is one of the biggest challenges that we have in our space, just due to the rapid evolution of hardware and software. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is directly for Dr. Grady, and it's from another Q&A audience member, and they ask, how can I go about merging my knowledge in analytical chemistry with robotics and AI? That's a great question. So I'm, I'm not a chemist, so that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. So that's something that you will have to do a little bit more research to find out. But I think chemistry and AI probably can be used in the healthcare industry with drugs and different things like that. But that that's a little bit something specific outside of what I use AI machine learning for. But what I would do is do some investigation to see if there are other scientists that are doing work in that area. And then you might be able to speak with one of them to determine how best you might approach whatever problem it is you're trying to solve. And so the thing with AI can be applied to any field, but you have to figure out what question it is that you specifically want to address and answer. So I would start there, do some research to see who is in that field of chemistry that brings chemistry and AI together and feel free to look at their work to determine what it is you might want to specifically do so that you can work towards that. If you don't mind me jumping in on your answer as well, one way that you can merge analytical chemistry um, and robotics is through automated processing. So normally when you're developing a drug, for instance, you might have 100 or 200 candidate molecules that may be the best case for treatment of a particular disease. And you can't screen them one at a time. It's not one person there moving things from one uh, pipette, pipetting from one test tube to the other. So we need robots that can do large scale process hundreds or thousands of samples, run them through the same type of um, assay, and then use machine learning and artificial intelligence to decide which one of those hundreds of candidate molecules actually best fits, for instance, the protein target um, that's important for that type of disease. So that's one example of the way that those two things could work together. Thanks for adding that. Um, Vivian is also asking for Dr. Dilworth, how are you able to merge professional dancing, uh, working in entertainment and working as a scientist all at the same time? <laughs> Yeah, until I just like developed my own career, that that did seem uh, pretty pretty challenging. Um, I think that science communication is my answer to that. I use my scientific training every single day, no matter what I'm doing, whether that is helping scientists to communicate better to the outside world, preparing them, for instance, for a media interview or if I'm the one doing the communicating, I use that scientific rigor and training. Um, when I get nervous <laughs> about talking in public like this, I reach back to my training on stage um, and I use the same skills that I learned as a dancer um, to kind of get over some of that, when the, uh, anterior cingulate cortex in my brain is telling me that I am putting myself in danger by speaking in public, I know that I can calm it down using some of those ticks, tr tricks, oh my gosh, tips and tricks. There we go. Um, and lastly, the importance of storytelling and narrative in the way that humans communicate is something that I started to learn as a young dancer and that neuroscience gave me a completely different vocabulary to describe why scientifically that's true. And then the outcome of that is me telling stories about science and scientists in the media as a science communicator. That's great, thank you. So our next question looks like a question for all of you. And uh, this audience member is asking, what are some changes due to the pandemic for your job? So we can start with Dr. Podrowski for this one and then pass it on to our next speaker. Yeah, the pandemic has moved so many things like this virtual and so many things online. Um, when I, you know, you have your annual checkup with your physician, well, that's now an e-visit. When you need to do things at school, that's online, banking, anything. 
And so with more communication, more activity going virtual and online, um, people, some people take advantage of that and do things that they shouldn't be doing. And so there has been a big uptick on uh, cases involving uh, risk and danger to children, um, mostly because they're all, all online right now. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you get a message from someone you don't know on any of your accounts, just ignore it, block it, report it. Um, do not engage. So just lock your accounts down. Make sure people can't find you if you don't want them to find you. Uh, but um, that unfortunately has been a uh, bad side effect of more people being online. Cool. Would you like to add Dr. Dilworth? Sure. I used to travel a lot. I used to go on location um, and visit the scientists in their labs to better understand what they do. Um, now it's really difficult to travel and really difficult to do that. And at the same time, because everybody is at home, as Dr. Ashley was just pointing out, the demand for content, the demand for those stories that I was talking about has gone way up because you know everyone's at home on their phones <laughs> or in Zoom meetings like this. So we have needed to create more content, tell more stories, and yet be further restricted in the ways that we can do that. So we're seeing a lot of sort of innovation, uh, a lot of expansion to new social media platforms. Um, and we're, we're trying to keep up with the demand for short stories um, that can be told digitally. And just to add to, the, to, to that, I would just say what they were just saying as far as workload. Workload has just increased uh, significantly uh, during a time where we probably should have put a pause and taken a break. I think for people working in the tech industry specifically, um, the workload is just, everything just went way up. And so I'm, I'm not sure how we're gonna continue to manage this uh, going forward um, at the pace that we're going. So just workload. So Isabella, I think we have time for two more questions. Cool. Um, I'll choose, let's see. I like this question. So most of us are in middle school or high school. So the audience would like to know, how have your aspirations changed or developed over time since you were our age? And can you elaborate on that experience of discovering your passion? So whoever would like to go first for this one. I can take, I can take that because it changed. I thought it changed a lot, but now as an adult, looking back, I realize it was always the same. Just the way that I thought I was going to accomplish those things changed. So I thought that I was going to be a professional dancer for the longest time, like maybe until I was in my early twenties, I even moved to New York. I trained at a professional dance school, the Alvin Ailey school. Uh, I, I was committed to that, but then I sort of, I started taking the subway uptown to see chemistry lectures, which if you've seen a chemistry lecture is a little bit crazy. And then I paid attention to that, what I thought was a shift in priorities and I decided to go to graduate school. Um, and so then I thought, oh, I'm not gonna be a dancer at all. I'm gonna be a scientist, I'm gonna be a chemist. Um, and I think I really felt like I was bouncing around um, not really knowing who I was and what I wanted to do, but really once I found the language to articulate that I cared about helping people understand the human experience and I helped, I wanted to help people better understand themselves in their world, um, then it all kind of came together. And now no matter what job I end up doing, if I lose my job as a science communicator, I will look for something else that helps me to achieve that mission. I mentioned in my uh, presentation that I always thought I'd be uh, an attorney. I'd go to law school. And um, that's something that I haven't given up on, but my husband thinks, okay, that much more school on top of everything else. <laughs> um, and I never thought I'd be in education. Uh, that, wasn't in, that wasn't anything that really interests me. Um, but being able to help people, I think, is, is the cornerstone of that, as uh, Dr. Dilworth said. And, and to me, uh, you know, I'm helping 
uh, young students in with cyber are understanding what this field is all about. I'm helping collegiate women um, earn their degree and learn about cybersecurity. And I'm, I'm helping uh, the law enforcement community with you know solving some challenges in digital forensics. So I think that that constant has stayed the same. Um, but how I apply that next, uh, right now I'm the interim vice president of research at DSU. So I'll help researchers become successful. So I think that has been the, the one parallel through, through my career that has stayed constant is trying to help. Yeah, and I'll say uh, I always love technology, uh, but I think uh, it's, it's similar to Dr. Ashley. Uh, I actually thought uh, when I was very, very young that I wanted to be an attorney, but a hairdresser because I said all oh, my clients would look beautiful uh, <laughs> when I represented them. But honestly, there's still a passion there with law because they have something called patent attorneys. And that's something that I would uh, specifically be interested in, um, although I think I'm finished with school. Um, but just knowing that the laws have not kept up with technology and just merging those two fields together, that's a very niche area. Um, and if I had the time, I would definitely bring the two together. Great, thanks for such thorough responses. So uh, we're gonna move on to our final question. Madeline, did you have anything to add? I uh, know, why don't we do that? And then I'll just have some closing remarks. Great, thank you. So for our final question, you all touched on certain challenges or obstacles you have had to overcome. What is the source of your confidence and drive and what tips do you have for audience members struggling with a similar experience? So we can start with Dr. Grady for this one, or? That's fine. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I always have a hashtag for the year. So that's kind of like starting my year off right. And it's also like daily affirmation, music. I love music. I have a couple of uh, people that I listen to that kind of get me going and get me charged up. Uh, but really what keeps me going and keeps me confident uh, is my faith. Um, I'm very faith-led person. I pray a lot. I um, work very, very hard. And I try to stay grounded in that because as I mentioned earlier, life is ever changing. And I just have to make sure that I'm resilient. And when things are happening to me that I'm bouncing back. And let me tell you something, my bounce back game is ridiculous. And so I just try to always walk through life with a smile. And uh, 2020 is definitely epic in all of the ways. So find what works for you, whether that's music like me, faith, and also a hashtag. One of the things that that uh, throughout the struggles that I've had in my career is just bringing people forward. You know, as I advance, having the hand back and pulling them with me because it gives me a lot of satisfaction knowing that the, the obstacles that I face, that if I face them with grace, that I can then help the other women behind me and, and pull them along with me and make their path a little less challenging than mine has been at times. I think for me, what I tend to lean into when things get difficult is community. And for some people that means family, for other people, that means friends or the family that we're not born into, but the one that we create for ourselves. Um, and for others, that means coworkers. And I think for me, honestly, finding a set of coworkers, a community of science communicators, all who live and work in the Los Angeles area, we have similar professional struggles um, a lot of us have performing arts backgrounds as well as science degrees. So finding my people in a way that I never expected to and being able to talk over some of the things that I'm struggling with, with people that really understand. Um, once that happened, I really felt myself sort of propelled forward on the basis of that shared experience um, and supportive community. Well, we're at time and I'll leave you all with a quote. And Helen Keller said, alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. And I really wanna thank uh, Mara, our ASL interpreter, Isabella, my co-MC, uh, our amazing speakers, uh, the tech, 
uh, Craig Newmark for making all of this, you know, happen today. And just a few house coming, house, housekeeping things. So we know a lot of you had questions that we didn't get to answer today, but in the chat, if we have your email or your name attached with your question, we promise to hunt down our speakers and get you some answers. Also, we will be sending out a, a recap email that will have some other resources um, in it as well. And uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much. For those of you who um, are not a member of the Institute, we have year round events that we're doing virtually right now, but we will be doing them hopefully back in person in a year or so. So we encourage you to join the Institute, which you can do at cjane.org. And uh, let's all go out and celebrate. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.